the letter of 3 John is where we're going to look at today. It's a letter we don't spend a lot of time with. The Apostle John, at the end of his life, probably the last of all the apostles to be alive, we know wrote the Gospel of John. We know that possibly the last book of the New Testament to be written actually in time was probably the book of Revelation. And somewhere during his ministry, he writes three letters. First John, we're pretty familiar with. Second and third John are a little shorter. Uh, third John is probably the shortest book in the New Testament. But in it, there's an interesting little verse. And as we've been talking about uh, gospel conversations, having gospel conversations with friends, with neighbors, with other individuals, obviously, one of those places and one of the kinds of conversations we need to have are gospel conversations with children. That if God has blessed children into your life in some way, shape, or form, and you have influence over them, then you have both the responsibility and the opportunity to communicate something of the gospel with those children. Uh, John writes these words in the fourth verse, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Now, John is probably not talking about biological children. We don't know whether he was married necessarily. Tradition says he may have been. But he's talking as a father, the father of the early church. He's talking as one of those revered men. And in all of his letters, First and Second John, he talks about the Christians that he writes to and he calls them children, my beloved, my children. But this idea that John, looking on his children, these children, he says, they're just a joy. And I would suggest to you that for Christian mothers and for Christian fathers, for Christian grandparents, can there be any greater joy than to know that your children or your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, those children that are a part of your life, can there be any joy greater that to see them come to know Jesus Christ. And then to see them walk and grow in that faith and to walk in that truth, that's a joy. There is a joy in heaven when one person repents and comes to Christ. And with children, it's very significant. So let me just suggest a couple of things to you that we can do. But first of all, before we talk about the things you and I can do to impact those children in our lives that we know, let me suggest to you some things about the nature of the salvation that we have that are important. For instance, there is for adults who have children in their lives no greater responsibility that I can imagine than to encourage those children toward Jesus Christ. That phrase, encourage anyone towards Christ, W.A. Criswell used that for many years, just as evangelism, encouraging your friends and neighbors toward Jesus. But in particular, when children are a part of your life, to encourage those children toward Jesus. You understand there's a biblical principle that with every blessing of God comes a responsibility, a stewardship of that blessing. God gives you a spiritual gift. He expects you to use it. God blesses you financially. He expects you to be responsible. If God gives you a blessing, there's a responsibility. And the greater the blessing, the greater the responsibility. Is there any greater blessing than the gift of a child? An eternal soul. And I will tell you, it may be the most significant blessed responsibility that we have to encourage them toward Jesus. It's a tremendous one. In fact, it's underscored by almost a warning. You remember that Jesus, one of the harshest statements he makes, almost as a warning, he says, of one particular activity, it'd be better if you had a millstone, one of those huge stones that they used to grind grain years ago. It'd be better if you had one of those tied around your neck and be thrown into the sea than to offend a little one. Or more specifically, the idea is that you would somehow keep a little one from coming to Jesus. That's a significant statement. So there is a tremendous responsibility, and I believe that it exists for all families. I believe it exists for the body of Christ, for the church. We have this phenomenal responsibility to help children come to Jesus. Secondly, I want to suggest to you that salvation by its very nature involves the ability to understand and to respond. 
there must be a cognizant. There must be an understanding. And that gives way to a phrase that sometimes it's, it's not in the Scripture, but it's a pretty important one because it talks about the nature of how children can come to Christ. And it's the idea of the age of accountability. And what it basically says is that once we understand the nature of sin and who Jesus is, we are then accountable. That once we reach an age where we understand that we are sinners, and by the way, I don't think you can be saved if you don't acknowledge that you're a sinner. If you don't understand that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, you don't have to have a lot of theology, but there's some basic things to be understood. And there's this sense that once we are at a point to understand, we are then accountable. In fact, Scripture says, to him who knows to do right and does not do it, that becomes sin. So there is this sense of understanding. Now, when does that happen? Well, it's different ages for every different person. In fact, the reality is there are some children who, for a variety of different reasons, may never in their lifetime, even as adults, be able to completely understand the nature of sin, and we have to think about that. But normally, as far as children making professions of faith, children being baptized, uh, I've talked to children at five who knew all the right answers. I, I Usually it's a little bit older, six and seven, eight, nine, ten, I, I think... Typically about 7 to 12 is kind of the range where in evangelical churches throughout the country more children make professions of faith in that age range. But it has a lot to do with how that child is raised and how often they're in church and how active their families are. But there's a sense of a time when it's pretty critical to come to go to Christ. In fact, it still holds true though that if children don't respond to Jesus during that time frame, as they get older to be teenagers, by the time they reach the age 17, I believe the fact is that from that moment on, for every day they do not come to Christ, the likelihood is with every day increasing that they never will. In other words, this window of opportunity for us to influence children towards Jesus is pretty important. But let's also back up, and I... I hope this is a word of comfort because we also need to think about those children who never reach that age where they are able to understand. And you understand there are sad things that happen. There are miscarriages. In our society, there are abortions. There are children that are stillborn. There are children that have significant birth defects or not able to survive. There are tragic accidents, and it's almost the most tragic thing I know to go and do a funeral for a small child. But what happens to that child? And, and it's a challenge because from almost within the moments of conception, there is DNA that is present. In other words, there is a living person that we are known by God in the womb. And so this issue of what happens to that child? Well, there's not really a lot of Scripture. There is that principle that if you know to do right, then you are accountable. And it sounds to me in some sense that we have to trust the mercy of God. That if a child is never able to understand right and wrong, if they're never able to understand sin, if they never are at a place where they can understand the gospel, then I believe that child is entrusted to the mercy and the grace of a God who is very merciful and very gracious. There's one passage in the scriptures that I know of that addresses this. And it's kind of side. It's 2 Samuel chapter 12. David has had an affair with Bathsheba. And a child is born. And the child is born ill, sick. And there's a question of whether or not the child is going to die. And, and to that end, David begins to fast. And he puts on sackcloth, that's really rough, burlap kind of material, and he puts ashes on his face. And it was kind of a, it was a normal thing to do when you were grieving, when there had already been a death, you would then go through this. And it was kind of the way they dressed outside to show how they were feeling on the inside. And David was doing that and praying that God would heal the child. God did not. And not every prayer is answered. The child dies. And when David hears that the child has died, he, he changes clothes and he washes his face and he calls for food and it, that is, the, uh, the servants are all kind of confused. They're saying, well, we don't understand. We, we thought now was when you would start to grieve. And David said this, 
while the child was alive, I could pray that God might be merciful and spare him. Now that he has died, all I can do is go to him. And what that means is, in David's mind, the child who died was in the presence of God. The child who died had gone through the valley of the shadow of death and was in his presence. And David understood that when he died, he would go to be with him. And and that's my personal conviction that those children, and, and again, in the midst of a sad reality, that is, I think, one of the great moments of comfort that those children are in the presence of God. Now, I also get this asked to me, I, what, what are they like in heaven? And when David got there, how would he experience it? And there's really no inference in the Bible that really addresses that. I will offer this as my personal thought. The reason that we will be in heaven, our goal, our purpose, is to praise and glorify God forever. So if those children are in heaven, I think while they're there, however God chooses to do it, they are there to praise and glorify God. And could God take the DNA and turn it into the person that they might have been or could have been or should have been, that one who they were conceived and they had knowledge of God from the womb and God takes them there. I don't know about that. I don't understand it, but I do know that there is a sense that when children are coming to that age to make a decision, we need to be encouraging them toward Jesus. The third thing I want to say before we talk about the specifics are children do not need to become like adults to be believers. Adults need to become what? Like children. Now, what does that tell you? That means that children can come to Jesus. In fact, Jesus, Matthew 18, made it pretty clear. If you're going to get into the kingdom of God, you've got to become like a child, which means that the innocence of children, the easy faith, the trust of children is the perfect time to make a commitment, a decision to receive what God has to have. So, having said some of those things, and I know those are challenging things, here's some things that you and I can do. got seven suggestions that you and I can do. If there is a child in your life, If you're an aunt, an uncle, grandparent, grandfather, neighbor, if there's a child in your life, here's things that you can do. Number one, live the gospel. And by that I mean the greatest gospel conversation you will have with your children is the example that you live. They're going to see you. They're going to watch you. And just for a few examples, I hope your children, grandchildren, etc., sometimes see you with the Bible in your hand. See you reading the Bible. Maybe see you carrying it on the way to church. See that when you drop them off for Sunday school, you're going to Bible study as well because you realize at some point that child is maybe going to have the Bible opened and verses from the Bible are going to be shared with them that are going to explain to them how to become a Christian. And if they've seen the Bible in your hands, it'll make a difference. I hope they have seen and heard you pray. Meal times, if nothing else. That's a great way for your children, your grandchildren, etc., to hear you pray. You pray, and then encourage them to pray, and they need to learn to pray, and they need to see the prayer of your life so that when the moment comes under the influence of the Spirit of God that they are ready to pray and trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, prayer is not a foreign thing. You ought to see you go to church. You ought to bring them to church. In fact, it ought to be a regular thing. It ought to be natural. And and there ought to be a sense that they ought to see you worship. And in our church, we do child care. We do it through up about age five. And then after they get to first grade, we have children come into the worship service. We had a bunch of kids in the first service. And I will tell you that every once in a while people come up and they'll say, well, why don't we do children's church? I mean, let them hang around for a while. And then when the sermon comes, because that's the really boring time, I know. Then we take the kids out. Of course, some of you'd want to go with them. I I know. Let me tell you, I understand there's a value in a children's church. I understand that. But let me tell you, there is a value in children watching adults worship. 
There's a value in children looking up at their dad. And I've seen this in our own services where a child looks up at their mom or their dad as they're singing. I will tell you, there is a gospel being lived out. And as they watch you, even though they're not maybe paying attention, they're watching you pay attention. They're watching you open the Bible. And they're watching you bow your head during the invitation. That is a powerful message of the gospel. It's a part of living the gospel out. Love your kids. Tell them that you love them. Show them that you love them because someday they need to be able to respond to the love of Jesus Christ. And they need to hear it from you so that it means something when it comes from Jesus. And as you're teaching them right from wrong, so they understand what sin is. That's part of learning right and wrong so you can comprehend sin. Also, give them grace and sometimes forgive them and sometimes let the punishment go because that prepares them to understand the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus. So first of all, live the gospel. Then secondly, have gospel conversations, faith conversations. Let's call them faith conversations first. That there's an opportunity as children, as they're growing up, as they're three and four and five, as they're six and seven, ask them, So what did you learn in Sunday school today? By the way, that implies you brought them to Sunday school. But secondly, don't believe everything they say because not everything they say they really learned in Sunday school. Trust me, we got better teachers than that. But uh, what did you learn in Sunday school? What did you you hear in the sermon? Uh, Which will require, because they may ask you, what did you hear during the sermon? So you got to be paying attention to all of that. If we have a baptism, a great opportunity on the way home to have a faith conversation. Communion, I I mean, I stand up here all the time when we do communion and to watch a child who is not yet a Christian see their parents take the bread and take the cup and then pass the tray on to the next person and that kid's watching that. I mean, they're just, I guarantee you, you can have a faith conversation about what that means and why do we do that and why can I not do it yet? It's a great opportunity. Faith conversations, faith conversations about Christmas and about Easter. Yeah, yeah. Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, but by the way, here's what these really mean, and you have these opportunity for faith conversations, to have them when things are going on at school, when they're afraid, in the middle of a thunderstorm. Is that not a great time to talk about Jesus loving you and wanting to take care of you? Faith conversations, and anyone in any family with any child can have a faith conversation. Reading Bible storybooks. If you don't have one, you need to get those ones. Little, there's little books that just tell the stories of the Bible very simply, and then you move on. And by the way, my, my one concern is that you keep the Bible story books maybe in a separate place on the shelf from Dr. Seuss and the Berenstain Bears, that you understand that these are okay and they're fun to read, and I like reading those, but these stories are a little different, and somewhere there needs to be that significance. In other words, live the gospel, have faith conversations, and start from as long as they're living, as long as you have the opportunity, have faith conversations with them. And by the way, parents need to have it, grandparents need to have it, aunts, do you realize that the more faith conversations they have, the more natural it would be for them to come to Christ? Share your testimony. I hope your children and grandchildren have heard when you came to know Christ. Have heard your personal story of faith. Certainly when you're having those faith conversations, somebody gets baptized. Oh yeah, I remember when I was baptized and this is what happened. I began to to sense something in my heart and I knew that I was a sinner and I talked to my mom or my dad or the pastor or somebody and I, and I knew and I learned about Jesus and this is how it happened and this is when I made my decision and this is why I was baptized. There ought to be those wonderful faith conversations is how you came to know Christ. In fact, when I do have the opportunity to talk to children with their parents present, before we ever get around to the children, I always will at some point stop and say, well, mom, tell us Tell us when you became a Christian. Dad, tell us when you became a Christian. Your children need to hear that. And if no other reason, and it doesn't really fit into this, but someday they may stand next to your casket. And I will tell you what a tremendous blessing it is when somebody can say, I know where my mother is because this is the story of when and where and how she became a Christian, and I know it. 
I'm not worried about where dad is because I've heard my dad talk about his faith in Christ and I know what it means. Share your testimony. Live the gospel. Have faith conversations. Share your testimony. Share the gospel. At some point, those kinds of faith conversations, their child is going to say, well, how do I become a Christian? If I can't have communion because I'm not a Christian yet or if I can't be baptized because I've never really trusted Jesus, how do I do that? I want to tell me. And when they ask, always tell them. Just tell them the story. They may or may not be ready to respond. They may be too young to respond. It may not be the right time, but always be open and ask their questions. And you can do it by using those verses out of the book of Romans. Romans 3.20 and 6.23 and 5.8 and and 10.9 and 10 and 13. Or just John 3.16. God so loved the world that even though we were sinners... That he didn't want us to perish because of our sin, but he wanted us to have everlasting life. And that's why Jesus came, to be able to tell the simple story that, yes, we are all sinners. Two-year-olds are sinners, and seven-year-olds are sinners, and moms and dads are sinners. But Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins, and then he rose again on the third day so that we could have eternal life. Just simply tell them the story. Share the gospel. And if you're not prepared and you don't know how to do that for the sake of your children and the children in your life, figure out how to share the gospel. Find it. Find a way. Talk to someone. Ask the question. If you're not sure, at some point, talk to someone else. One of the greatest joys of my life is when parents and grandparents, family members say, Pastor, so-and-so's thinking about asking Jesus to come into their heart. They're asking questions about being a Christian. Could, could we come in and talk? Now, I think all parents ought to be able to do that on your own. You really don't need me. But sometimes it's not bad to connect with someone, and and I've talked to an awful lot of folks in my office, an awful lot of people, and we've had conversations about sharing the gospel, and I'm more than willing to do it. In fact, frankly, that's a lot better than a lot of the junk i got to do as a pastor. That's more exciting. Make my day. Let me talk to somebody about knowing Jesus, and it's also the opportunity, and when I talk to children, I always, and I never press hard, but I always say, in the end, You have to be ready. You have to be at the place where you're ready. And usually I I don't let the child, unless it's really obvious, they've been asking questions for weeks and months and they are desperately ready. Most of the time I say, you go home and you think about it. Because there's another thing. The sixth thing is you need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Becoming a believer is not just about having the right answers to the question. A lot of kids can get the right answers. And by the way, I was, somebody was talking to a Sunday school teacher, and they got one kid. doesn't make a difference what the question is. The kid always says Jesus, which, by the way, is right most of the time. I mean, it's a good answer, but no matter, you know, who made the world? Jesus. Uh, who did? Jesus. I mean, that doesn't make any difference, you know. Who's your favorite parent? Jesus. I mean, they just, that's what they say to everything, Jesus. Uh, But there are kids who can get the right answers, but the right answers are not enough. There also has to be the work of the Spirit of God. And if you're sensitive, you'll know. And when your children are asking questions, answer the questions. And if they keep asking them over and over, or they ask the question one Sunday when somebody's baptized and they don't bring it up for another three or four weeks, well, maybe it's not time. But if they start bringing it up every single week, then you begin to know. The Spirit of God is at work in their hearts, and there can be genuine transformation. There can be a born-again significance. Well, the final thing, live the gospel, faith conversation, share your testimony, share the gospel, talk to others if necessary, be sensitive to the Spirit, and then finally pray for them. Pray for God to be at work. there. From the moment you know you're going to have a child, start praying for that child. For the moment that child is born, start praying for that child. If they're grandkids or nieces or nephews or whoever it is, pray for them by name. Pray that God is going to be at work in their life. Pray for their parents. Pray for the other people who are going to be involved in their life. Pray for opportunities to encourage them toward Jesus. Pray for the church. Pray for the church that we will be a church that supports and encourages children, that does ministries for children. Because I knew this was the sermon. I made a little detour from my office to the third floor. 
And by the way, I also walked down the preschool hallway and I prayed for all the preschool workers and the child care workers so that from the moment a child shows up in this church, they know the love of others so they can know the love of Jesus. And then as they're working their way down that preschool hallway and they're learning that God is love and they're learning that Jesus died on the cross and that Jesus rose again and they they go down and then they get up to first and second grade and third and fourth and fifth and sixth, which by the way is where most of that real action happens, where they begin to reach the age of accountability and they understand. And so I prayed for first and second grade and third and fourth grade and prayed for fifth and sixth grade teachers and I prayed for what goes on up there because that's powerful stuff and Awana teachers and child care workers and vacation Bible school and all of the ministries we do with children. But particularly, pray for your own children. and Pray for them by name. And I will tell you that I am often reminded of some adult parents and grandparents whose children maybe never made a profession of faith. And they're still praying for them. They're teenagers, they're in college, they're out of college on their own, and their parents are still praying for them because there is no greater joy than to know that your children are walking in the truth. Now today, we're going to have our invitation hymn, and obviously it's an invitation and encouragement for you to be thinking about the children in your life, the children that you love, the children that you care about, and to some extent, If they're in your life, then there is a responsibility for us to encourage them toward Jesus in everything we do. Let's stand and let's sing. If you need to make some response, this is a good time to do that as well.